The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 14 The creature's moaning was louder now, as if rousing from unconsciousness, and the clearly audible undercurrents of pain and misery in the cries were lamentably familiar, but this did nothing to diminish their horror. Everything Erin had seen down here led her to think that she was about to find yet another mutilated victim of the Hewitts. She knew that if she went round to see where the cries were coming from, she would discover one more repellent denial of free will, one more barbaric mistreatment of life, and she didn't know if she could cope. She was terrified of what she might see and was afraid of being attacked. What if this was all part of the game to lure her nearer and nearer to her death? For all she knew, there could be more of them, some maniac she hadn't yet encountered down here waiting for her. Or there could be another way into the basement and old Monty could be hiding in the darkness, watching her with his fat, psychospastic son. But then she heard more whimpering and reached a decision. If she denied the tortured creature her help, then the Hewitts had already won. She couldn't just walk away. So, clutching the knife for self-defense, Aaron crept towards the corner of the room. Most of what scant light there was in the basement seemed to be coming from here. Fiery shadows flickered on the walls, and she could hear the faint crackling and snapping of hot wood and charcoal. Her feet were still submerged in the cold, stinking water, but she tried not to splash or make any sound whatsoever. She didn't want anyone to hear her approach, though once she turned the corner, there was no way she could remain unseen. The plaintive cries grew louder, more frequent. Aaron took a deep breath and stepped around into the furnace area. More horror, more degradation, more despair. Just as with every other part of the basement, Aaron found herself looking at a crazed collage of heavy rope, hooks, crisscrossing beams, and dirty clothing, chains, buckets, and butchery tools, all covered in wet blood and shit, as if someone's bowels had been ripped open then hurled around the room. There were pills of stuff she couldn't even begin to guess at. One looked like it was holding three knives, left to stand in a foamy bucket or something of blood and a uh, puke. If there was any kind of logic to this hellhole, Aaron could not begin to see it. The furnace itself was a decorative standing stove made of cast iron. It threw light into the room and gave off enough heat to make the ambient stench even more pungent and gut-wrenching. Sitting in front of the closed furnace, grill was a bathtub. It stood in the middle of the room like a lighthouse in a sea of pulleys, sawtooths, and shit. The sides of the bath were coated with the same indefinable body crap as the rest of the room, only more so. And in the bath sat not an animal, but a human being. Aaron's mistake made her feel guilty, as if somehow she had been responsible for the destruction of this person's identity. She should have known it was a human making that pathetic noise. She should have known. The groaning from the figure slumped in the bathtub was strangely muted, and the person showed no sign of being aware of Aaron's presence. For her part, Aaron was too frightened to say anything, but she forced herself to step forward to take a closer look. If there was any way she could help, if there was anything she could do, anything except it looked like a man, though it was hard to tell. There was a large bloody gash in the middle of his back which Aaron immediately recognized from the meat hook injury she had seen on Andy. His hands seemed to be tied together but his face was difficult to make out. They'd left him in the bathtub halfway full of brown murky bloody water packed with ice cubes. The bastards were keeping him fresh. Aaron took another step closer. The flickering light of the furnace shone straight at him. His head was pitched forward and he rocked gently side to side as he moaned. 
She was sick of this, sick of all this hatred. The man looked up and she screamed. His face was another skin mask, the very same mask that Leatherface had been wearing before he took Kemper's face. Only now, the eyes and mouth had been sewn up, leaving more erratic stitches to disfigure the mask's deathly countenance. The stitches stopped the wearer of the mask from seeing anything other than the decaying eyelids of a dead man, and they also subdued the sounds of his moaning. But the mask was too large for the victim's head, so it had become a bulbous, puffed-up distortion of a corpse. Oh my god! cried Aaron, revolted by this further demonstration of obsessive dehumanization. The man in the bathtub had been forced to wear a face of human skin, a face peeled off the head of a terrified murder victim, a face Hewitt had fondled, played with, and sewn tightly into a mask, a face Hewitt had worn over his own cancerous features while he'd butchered Kemper and Andy. The prisoner's identity was submerged beneath four fibrous layers of mutilation. Suddenly, he bolted upright, flinging his head back and splashing the ice-cold puke swill over the sides of the tub. His chest billowed as the shock of the freezing water cut into his waking bones. He lashed out with his legs, and when he threw his head to the side, the mask fell off. It was Morgan. He was still wearing the handcuffs Sheriff Hoyt had slapped on him at the old Crawford Mill. His mouth was swollen and disfigured. His lower jaw was broken. Some of his teeth had been smashed out and his eyes were bulging under the pressure of extreme terror. Aaron hurried forward. Oh my god! Morgan wasn't trapped like Andy had been and it looked like he could move, despite his horrible injuries. But even if he survived this nightmare, what kind of future could Morgan look forward to? He seemed quite conscious now, but totally lost. At first, he wanted to get up out of the tub. Aaron tried to help. Neither of them saying a word, but he fell and she slipped, screaming back onto the ground beneath a torrent of bloody bathwater. She looked up. Morgan was extending his bound hands out towards her like a helpless child. He was watching the two of them through a hole in the furnace room ceiling. He saw her help him. Saw her. Saw. 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 Morgan stood beside the warm furnace, fighting for clarity of thought. His mind was adrift on a sea of pain, and he even had to struggle to remember who he was, but each second he was growing stronger. And now there was two of them. Aaron had found new hope. Once she was sure she had gotten through to Morgan, she quickly set about finding somewhere to hide. Given that the basement was full of alcoves, shelves, and wooden supports, it should have been easy, but she found nothing. Aaron was pleased to see Morgan come and join her, though the sight of his beaten face was soul-destroying, and together they looked for another way out. But again, it looked as if they were going to come up empty-handed. The basement shook with the ferocious cyclone impact of the sliding metal door. They looked at each other in panic. They both knew what that resounding crash meant. It meant death. Oh, over here! It was a kid's voice. Jedediah. But where? There were heavy footsteps coming down the staircase, and they could hear the pull starter being yanked. Hurry! shouted the boy, and now Aaron could see him. His head was poking out from behind an old crate, and he was waving to her. Pull once. She ran over towards the boy, Morgan close behind her, and now she could see that the crate was concealing a large hole in the wall, leading to a tunnel. Pull twice. Jedediah urged them on as Aaron pushed the crate aside and helped Morgan through into the tunnel. His handcuffs were a real problem. The third pull and roar. Praise the Lord and pass the gasoline. Aaron could hear Leatherface hurtling down the narrow staircase. He had the chainsaw in his hands and was revving the two-stroke shit out of it. They were in a passageway, made from brick and cinder block. 
interspersed with sections of crude wooden panels lashed together with rope. Jedediah was already way ahead of Aaron, his whole body aching for her to catch up. She didn't know what to make of the boy. He had survived a brutal attack on his family, but for what? The Hewitts seemed to treat him as if he were one of their own. What if he was? And why should the boy help Aaron and Morgan? Just whose side was he on? Behind her, Leatherface broke into the furnace room and came screeching towards the tunnel. The chain with the cutting blades turned and turned and turned, breaking the crate up into several wooden limbs. Soon, Aaron was with Morgan and Jedediah. The small boy flashed her a brief smile, then ran ahead down the underground passage. They could hear the engine. They could hear that engine of the chainsaw raging in the tunnel behind them. He was coming. The tunnel ended in a small square room made of concrete, a tornado shelter. There were no lamps in the storm cellar, but seams of moonlight filtered in through the cracks in a wooden hatch above them casting just enough illumination for Aaron to make sense of their surroundings. A couple of the walls were lined with shelf racks, stacked with rows of mason jars, and there were a few boxes of junk scattered on the floor, but no weapon and no way to stop Hewitt coming into the shelter. But then, that was never the plan. Jedediah stood at the bottom of a stepladder that climbed up to the hatch and waited for Aaron to lead the way. She ran up the first couple of steps, but the third snapped in two beneath her, making her cry out as her leg dropped straight down. Morgan reached up to steady her, both his hands still linked by the steel handcuffs. In return, Aaron tenderly put an arm around his back and helped him up the ladder with her, and together the two of them made their way up towards the weather-beaten hatch, their ears almost bleeding from the oncoming fury of the chainsaw. Above ground, one of the storm doors flipped open, then another, and suddenly they could taste sweet, fresh air. Aaron was still only halfway up the stairs, but it helped Morgan to climb out ahead of her. She watched him disappear through the hatch and then turned down to hold a hand out to Jedediah. But the boy was still standing at the bottom of the steps. He just looked at her, not moving. Then Leatherface entered the cellar. The chainsaw raged like a burning scab inside the close quarters of the bunker, and still the boy refused to come. Aaron was about to beg Jedediah to join her, but she'd run out of time. She could see Leatherface without thought or pause making straight for the stepladder. Jedediah tried to get in his way. He ran straight at the maniac and tried to push him back, but the boy was nothing against the killer and was easily swatted aside by one powerful, oval-stained hand. Clouds of exhaust smoke rose up the steep wooden stairs as Jedediah crashed into one of the shelves and brought the whole lot down on top of him. Dozens of jars fell forward and broke upon the stone floor, shaking Aaron out of her shock at the scene of mindless cruelty she'd just witnessed. Leatherface had reached the foot of the ladder. He held the chainsaw in one hand, never once disengaging the cutting chain, and screamed at her, howling to be heard through the five-horsepower engine. Aaron turned and scrambled up towards the open flat shutters. With only a few creaking steps to go, she reached up and grabbed hold of the sides of the hatch and began to haul herself out. Morgan, grimacing from the agony of the hook wound in his back, bent down and held out his manacled hands to help her, pulling her up. She was almost outside when she felt a soft, clammy vice close around her left ankle. Leatherface had got her. No! She raged kicking her legs, but the sweating, dirty clamp wouldn't let go, and now it was shaking and pulling her down towards the gasoline chain cacophony. Aaron knew what would happen to her. He'd do what he'd done to Andy, slice her leg, disable and subdue her, bring her back under his power so that he could dress her up in dead skin and then kill her. But Morgan wouldn't let go. He was in agony. Leatherface was much stronger than he was, but he wouldn't let go of Aaron's hand. And now the cuffs were helping him, supporting his wrist as he locked both his hands around her and pulled. His muscles tensed and he cried out in pain, yet still he held fast. Aaron was being torn between the two of them, but it was clear who was winning. She was sliding down and Morgan was being dragged ever closer to the lip of the hatch. His leg was being brought within full dismembering range of the chainsaw. 
There was only one way this could end, and yet they'd come so close to being free again. <coughs> the cry came from Hewitt, only it wasn't his usual demented hollering. It was more like the shrill wheezing of a poisoned rat. Aaron looked down and saw Jedediah's teeth sunk firmly, deeply, doggedly into the burly, fitted hand holding her ankle. The boy had come up to help her, and at last Aaron knew Jedediah was not family. Suddenly, the crushing weight pulling on her leg was gone, and she was almost flying up through the open hatch, propelled by this unexpected release of momentum. Outside, Aaron saw just how bright the moon was. The whole area had become a patchwork of silver grass and long black shadow. Morgan painfully helped her to her feet, and then they stepped back and watched to see what was happening. The chainsaw had fallen silent, and neither could they hear any more fighting or voices. Everything within the storm cellar had grown unnaturally and abruptly silent. Aaron peered down through the hatch and saw Jedediah emerge from the darkness. He was smiling. He had Hewitt's blood on his lips, and he stretched out his arm so that they could help him up. Morgan took the boy's left arm, Aaron took his right, and they began to lift. As the chainsaw powered into life and tore into Jedediah's back, the tip of the chainsaw broke out through the boy's stomach, flinging blood and child intestine onto Aaron's face. Morgan cried out and let go of Jedediah's hand. Aaron realized there was nothing they could do for the boy now. She took one last look at Jedediah's weeping, agonized face, dripping with blood, then slammed the storm hatch shut. Jedediah had sacrificed himself for her, and she could never do anything to repay him but she was determined he wouldn't die in vain. Through the closed hatch, they could hear the lifeless, ruptured body of Jedediah fall down the stairs, followed by fast, heavy footsteps and the victorious revving of the blood-soaked chainsaw. Morgan had already left Aaron behind, but she had no trouble catching up with him. Together, they hurried down the grassy ridge away from the farmstead. There was no point taking the road from the house because Hoyt had the patrol car. Nor was it a good idea to follow the trail back to the mill. The van was out of action, and the access road led straight back to Luda Maze. So Aaron veered in a different direction and helped guide Morgan towards the cover of some nearby trees. She wasn't sure where she was headed, but she didn't care as long as it was away from... The storm hatch broke open, spewing Leatherface out from the earth, and almost immediately the stillness of the night was raped and butt-fucked by the grinding chainsaw. Neither of them spoke as they ran through the dark thicket. Morgan wasn't even sure if he could talk anymore. His mouth hurt too much to try. Leatherface was coming after them. By now, Erin was getting used to charging through woodland. She was used to all the scratches and bruises as she tripped and blindly pushed her way through stuff. Only now, she didn't give a damn. All she cared about was that she didn't fall over. Morgan, on the other hand, was in a bad way. He managed to keep pace, but every footstep sent pain tearing through his body, and he couldn't help but cry out. Aaron took the lead and tried to knock all the branches and creepers out of her friend's way, but it was slowing her down, and she could hear the chainsaw getting closer. She didn't stop to look, but she was sure that Leatherface was howling through the thicket behind her, stomping on all the green shit like he was a little baby retard. Suddenly, they came out of the grove and staggered into a clearing. Hundreds of stars twinkled on the ground before them and immediately they knew they were looking at the myriad reflections of the moon on the chrome and broken glass of the automobile graveyard, and another vehicle had been added to the collection. When the van had come off the factory line, it had been a plain old production standard Chrysler Dodge A100 wagon, but to look at it now, the van had been toppled and was lying on its side, the wheels had been removed, doubtless for sale at Luda Maze, the roof was a confused tangle of chainsaw gashes, but all this bloody coating would have meant jack shit if Kemper hadn't already been dead. It struck Aaron that every smashed-up car in the clearing was actually a tombstone. Each vehicle rested in silent testimony to the butchered and the dead who were just passing through. Morgan gripped her hand and looked at her imploringly. 
She couldn't believe just how badly battered his face was, yet he'd survived. God bless him. The meaning of his gesture was clear. They could both hear the chainsaw coming. They had to get out of here. Aaron cut a path through the silhouettes of broken transport and led Morgan to the far side of the car cemetery. There they saw the prairie stretch out, vast and barren, before them, and it seemed like there would be nowhere to hide beneath the sliver of moonlight, but it was open, it was free, and they ran for it. It was Morgan who saw the old house first. The building was concealed within a clump of tall oak and there were no lights in any of the windows. Yet the boy had recognized the crooked angular silhouette for what it was. Aaron's first thought was that there might be someone in there who could help them. But the closer they ran towards the place, the more it appeared that the large two-story structure was derelict. By now, Morgan was in a real bad way. All his strength seemed to be deserting him, and Aaron almost had to drag him by the shoulders through the geometrically intricate wrought iron gates in front of the house. However, they were both gulping for air by the time they reached the front door. Aaron knocked. No answer. They hadn't heard the chainsaw for a minute or two, not since the flat empty ground of the prairie had quickened their retreat, but they couldn't waste a single second of their time. Either someone inside would help them, or they'd use the place to hide. Aaron tried again, but it was clear there was nobody home, at least nobody normal. Not waiting any longer, Aaron turned the door handle. The door opened and they crept forward into the house. Inside the building was a worm-riddled heap of rotten timber. The air was thick with dust while the floors were covered in rat shit. None of the walls looked very sturdy. One strong gale and the place would probably collapse into a useless heap of firewood. Surprisingly, there were glass panels in most of the windows, but there were no drapes or blinds and the panes were all coated with cobwebs and dirt. A few of the windows, however, had been boarded up. All the same, there was enough ambient light to reveal that the house was littered with scraps of broken furniture, the upholstery eaten away by vermin. Aaron took Morgan deeper into the building, away from the bare windows and further into the darkness. They could hear the chainsaw now. Hewitt was outside and heading straight for the house. Suddenly, Aaron had to cope with her own rising panic. She couldn't deal with Leatherface anymore. Why didn't he just quit? Why wouldn't he leave them alone? Why couldn't he just fuck off and die? Morgan sighed with pain, bringing Aaron back to her senses. Quickly, she grabbed hold of him and steered him into a room that was pitch black, except for a single hole in a boarded-up window, through which shone a laser-like shaft of pure silver. The corner of the room opposite the window was lost in total darkness, so they staggered over into it and froze. Maybe if they kept quiet enough, Hewitt would go right past the house. He had no way of knowing they were in there. They could have just kept on running. Morgan coughed hurriedly, raising his cuffed hands to stifle the noise, but he needn't have bothered, because there was no way Leatherface could hear anything over the deafening gas rattle of the chainsaw. It was getting louder now. They could hear him coming closer and closer to the home. There was a squeak of corroded metal, the wrought iron gate. Leatherface was outside. The engine was cut. No chainsaw, no motor, no exhaust, nothing. Just silence. Aaron could hear breathing, but it took her a moment to realize that the breathing was her own. Like Morgan, she was trying to catch her breath from their running. They were hyperventilating with fear, but they needed to quiet down. As long as that bastard had his chainsaw on, they knew exactly where he was, but now, now that the weapon had powered down, the psychopath could be anywhere. He might be outside the house, or he might have gone to look for them somewhere else or he might already be. The silence was killing her. She beckoned Morgan to stay still, then tiptoed across to the hole in the boarded window. A moment later, and her terrified eye was looking out through the crack, searching frantically in all directions for... Leatherface was coming in through the front door. Their hiding place was useless. It hadn't worked. He was inside the house. They'd hoped he'd just walk on by, but they were wrong. They'd failed, and he was coming for them. He was inside the house, inside. 
They ran out, down along a short hallway to another room where they found a ragged couch set down on the floor. He rushed in after them, his fat, convulsive footfalls intimidating them as they fled, screaming before him. Aaron slammed the door shut, and then she and Morgan grabbed hold of the couch and dragged it across the room, almost slinging it down in front of the doorway. The chainsaw spewed into life and carved its vitriol straight through the door. One diagonal slice, then another, cutting a splintered X into the upper half of the boards. He knew they were in there. He could smell their fear. From outside the door, Hewitt punched the chain bar forward through the center of the cross gash, smashing a head-shaped hole in the painted wood. Aaron looked over and saw his leering masked face peering through the gap. Now he was bleeding in psychotic ecstasy and thrusting his bulky shoulders up against the closed door, as if to force his whole body through the jagged breach. At first, Aaron considered escaping through another door that she could see leading out of the room, but Leatherface would only come after them. They had to get out of the house altogether. She ran across to the boarded window and started to pull at some of the makeshift panels. Morgan tried his best to help, but just like Aaron, he found that the boards were nailed too tight. Hewitt's eyes shifted uncontrollably as he looked through the hole in the door. His every twitching freak of body skin showed how badly he wanted to break in and desecrate their flesh. Behind them, the chainsaw throttled into high gear and proceeded to carve a horizontal line at waist height, right across the door, refashioning the timber panels into a bastard form of a Dutch door. He'd be through any second. Morgan punched the board near the hole Aaron had looked through. The wood there was weak, and it splintered with a satisfying crack under the strength of the blow. But there was no time to dislodge the broken wood and climb through. Leatherface was already inside the room. They dashed across to the other door and found themselves sprinting through a maze of corridors and rooms with no clue where they were going, except away from the unrelenting scream of the chainsaw, racing after them. Finally, they reached a room that was bare except incredibly for a small crystal chandelier. Morgan saw a closet they could hide in and threw himself inside, but there was no room for Aaron. The boy did the best he could to make space for her, pressing his agonizing body up tight against the wall, but it was no good, and all the while Leatherface was bearing down on them, stomping his feet and weeping for the chainsaw's gut-ripping sanctity. Aaron stood back from the closet doorway and could see that one of the walls was hollow, and there was a hole in the wall leading through. If she could just... Aaron dived into the floor, and ignoring the putrid stench of rat piss, crawled feverishly through into the wall space. When he was sure she was safely hidden, Morgan gently closed the closet door and waited. Footsteps. He was in the room. He disengaged the clutch and the saw went low, ticking over, still pumping out exhaust fumes. They could hear his obsessive breathing, his hysterical whining. He was searching for them, looking, listening. A rat crawled on Aaron's leg. She stifled her disgust and kicked it off. The rat squealed. The chainsaw came screaming through the thin wall, stabbing the space above her head. Then it was gone. Aaron managed not to scream and curled up into as a tiny a ball as she could. She could do nothing but cover her head with her hands as the chainsaw penetrated the wall a second time, breaking through even closer to her body. Then he pulled back for a third violent thrust, which missed her head by the slightest whisper of blood. Each lunge was getting closer. Each time he penetrated the hollow wall, he came closer to cutting open the cringing little blood bag. The chainsaw reached peak revs, then just as quickly went dead. The engine switched off completely. Leatherface had sliced the wooden partition over and over, and now the wall behind Aaron was patchily illuminated with thin angled slims of projected moonlight. But where the hell was he? What was he waiting for? Slowly, Aaron got up, 
her back sliding against the wall as she rose to her feet. If she could just see out through the gashes he'd made. Two arms broke through the ruined wall behind her and grabbed her by the shoulders. Leatherface. With unstoppable force, the maniac seized Erin and pulled her back through the wall. The aged wood panel snapping and falling with her as she collapsed painfully into his power. Then, in one disordered motion, he lifted her and chucked her over his shoulder. She screamed and punched him on the back. She clawed at his face, collecting shreds of Kemper under her nails. But there was nothing she could do, nothing, and the sense of despair overwhelmed her. Hewitt lumbered back into the room, Aaron in one arm, the chainsaw in the other. She was struggling, trying to resist, but his attention had been grabbed by the sound of loud, rhythmic banging. Slow continuous, repeating. Morgan was standing outside the closet and was opening and closing the door to draw Leatherface to him. The anguished youth tried to speak, but thanks to Sheriff Hoyt, his words came out as nothing but primitive grunts. Yet still, the meaning was clear. There was sorrow in Morgan's cries. There was pain in them, but there was also sheer blind hatred. He was calling Hewitt to him. He was challenging the psychopathic skin fetishist motherfucker. He was trying to distract Leatherface so that Aaron might break free. Morgan, no! Cried the girl. He couldn't possibly win. But Morgan ignored her and ran close to Leatherface, stepping back, dodging, weaving, and then moving closer as if going to punch him. Hewitt slammed out an arm and chopped Morgan in the throat. The boy cried out and dropped to his knees, his windpipe in excruciating pain. He'd been so winded that if he hadn't already been struggling to breathe, he probably would have chucked. Leatherface pitched his shoulder forward and slammed Aaron onto the ground where he pinned her flat on her stomach by placing one of his fat spastic boots onto the flat of her back. Aaron squirmed and tried to crawl free, but he was too strong, and she felt her ribs threaten to crack under the pressure. Quickly, Hewitt dropped the chainsaw. It hit the old floorboards with the sound of a leather anvil, then picked the toothless little bastard up by the scruff of his scrawny neck. He hauled Morgan up towards the chandelier and hooked the boy's arms up over one of the metal and crystal branches, until suddenly the boy was hanging from the ornate light by his own handcuffs. Then Leatherface let go, causing Morgan to drop and the steel bracelets to cut deeper into the already bleeding skin of his wrists. Morgan cried out. The situation was helpless. Aaron underfoot, Morgan hanging like a fish on a hook, and Leatherface, master of them all. Morgan's legs kicked and flailed in midair, the turbulent shaking up dust and traces of stinking rat fuck. He tried to shout, but his jaw was broken and pain shot throughout his body. Leatherface wrenched on the starting cord of the chainsaw and suddenly he was back in shit-kicking business. Morgan wanted to scream but could only squeal like a piglet through his damaged mouth. Erin fought all she could and hollered in sympathy for what she knew must surely be coming. But she was like a fly on the windshield of the freeway. Thomas Brown Hewitt, on the other hand, roared through the serrated cylinder lips of the Kemper face and lifted the rotating cutter straight up through the middle of Morgan's legs. Up through the groin, up through the abdomen, blue sparks flying in the dark midnight room, and up through the victim boy's chest, roaring and killing the twitching little bastard as he shook from the chandelier in tight-lipped self-pity, the whining pathetic coon shit. Blood sprayed out from the jolting corpse, splashing against Hewitt's man apron, forming a cologne of death on Aaron's bare neck and face below. She looked up from beneath the bastard's shoe and watched him struggle as he tugged the saw up into bone and tendon. Wrench, 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 God damn it! how he wrenched, until at last the saw broke free and carved its way upwards in a fountain of red, cardiovascular puke. But the sharp release of the saw from Morgan's remains caused the killer to lose his balance. Leatherface toppled sideways, and suddenly Aaron was loose. She didn't wait. The moment she felt the bone-breaking weight shift from above her, she crawled forward and rolled out from under him. He saw her, but the chain was caught in Morgan's neck. He gave it more revs to crack through the spinal cord, but Aaron was already bursting out of the room. Leatherface screamed and fed the saw more and more power so that he could disentangle it from the hanging corpse and go out after her. Flecks of neck tissue spat into his mask and he squealed, licking the blood off his lips. 
Aaron hurtled down the passageway and out through the front door. They never should have stopped at that old place. How did they even begin to think they could have hidden in there from him? He probably knew every damn square inch of this town. It was his slaughter ground. And now Morgan was dead. Morgan. Poor Morgan. She remembered him rolling his joints, smiling without a care in the world. The poor bastard. Drops of Morgan's blood were on her tank top. She was limping and suddenly realized her leg was injured. She wasn't sure where or how. It all blurred into 12 hours of pain and she ran. The chainsaw sputtered and smoked in the moonlight, his screaming obese musculature wanting to kill her. Kill, kill, kill. Aaron sucked the air in tired, desperate gasps. The land was uncultivated and thick with weeds. Wild branches and vines tore at her, but they meant nothing. Morgan, Pepper, Andy, and Kemper were everything to her now. He saw her hit a branch and fall. She lay there still like a dead body. He would, no, she was rising. Please let me, please. She heard him flick the throttle. The chainsaw ripped and roared as she got up on her feet and carried on running. Christ, when she just fell, she saw him coming towards her, charging like a bull elephant soaked in Morgan's blood and wearing the face of her lover. The bastard just kept on coming. Why wouldn't he die? Why? They ran beneath the moonlit sky, locked in the almost prehistoric truth of man hunting his prey. There was a certain perverse beauty to the image of Aaron fleeing across this traditional Texan landscape with the impossibly iconic image of Leatherface chasing after her. His mask, his chainsaw, and the way he moved. They were a faultless lesson in the design of fear. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 14 of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake. Well, we thought Morgan was dead before, now we know he is for a fact, uh, but even though you didn't voice any lines tonight, Sean Campbell, you did a great job as Morgan, thanks for playing along. And if anybody listening would like to voice a character in a future audiobook here on the channel, just sign up on the Patreon uh, for as low as you start at the $10 tier and higher, and you can voice a character in each book. Um, and you get a lot of other great rewards as well, and you'll be supporting the channel, keeping it going and growing for years to come. Uh, I depend on the Patreon page since I'm not able to monetize the channel on YouTube. But yeah, I'm really enjoying this book so far. We're in the home stretch now. I think we've only got like two uploads left of this book. Uh, then I'm going to be uh, finishing Event Horizon and starting up on Final Destination, Destination Zero, which uh, does this cool thing from what I've heard. I haven't read it yet. But it's got a little bit of uh, backstory in it that ties in with, like, Jack the Ripper and stuff. So I'm really looking forward to that one. But yeah, I'm really enjoying this. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun wrapping up this book. Uh, the whole battle between Aaron and Leatherface, the chase, and the way things end. I can't wait to see how Stephen Hand covers that. I'll be back very soon with more. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. <laughs>